In this week's lectures, we talked about uh, several of the components of the immune system. And one of the great questions that came in was, uh, do these, uh, how do these different components, in particular the innate and the adaptive immune system, how do they work together? Do they synergize with each other? Do they conflict with each other? Does the upregulation of one response lead to a downregulation of the other and, in fact, make you more susceptible to infection with, with something that perhaps would be targeted with the other? Uh, and again, I think there are a, a number of really great examples of this, both in the in the plant and and the animal world. Right? And uh, Mary, you might have, you might have some some good comments on the on the role of this in in animal immunity. So, from an evolutionary perspective, those two systems have to be coordinated. Right? The the innate system evolved first, and it evolved. The adaptive system has evolved to receive uh, signals specifically from the innate system. And so th th they can't operate uh, independently. The other thing that's important is that you can mount individual responses. So you can be infected. You may have an infection in your thumb, and you may have uh, a respiratory infection. You're mounting those uh, the responses to those infections often independently. You, you must have the capability to respond to multiple uh, foreign agents at the same time. And so when it works, we don't pay any attention to the successes, that all of this, we're really multitasking all the time, right? So when can these, these interfere? Well, there's a, if a signal is inappropriately given, okay? There's a lot of regulation to make sure that, you know, a lot of checkpoints that say, was this signal really received? Mm. Okay, we're gonna go to the next step and then we're gonna check again, and check again, and check again. So lots, lots of uh, checks and balances, but it's biology, and occasionally we see uh, something where the, the regulation um, is, is off. And that's where we see disease. And again, we come back to this point that the majority of infections don't lead to disease. Okay? And disease can often be called because an in, uh, caused by an inappropriate uh, immunological response. So um, I think that in a couple of weeks, we'll have some specific examples of um, where these two systems get uh, out of sync. Mm -hmm. But the, the majority of the time, they must work together. And it's really quite an elegant choreographed dance. And so, do we have this? Uh, the, uh, do we have the same analogs of, of innate and adaptive immunity in the plant world? We do. Um, it's a little different. So we have innate immunity. Um, plants make a lot of anti, whatever compounds, antimicrobial compounds, um, that enhance their immunity. Or they do things like they trigger apoptosis in infected cells. Um, so to, that's to, that's to localized to death localize, of cells. Right. So they yeah they they kill off the cells that are infected to prevent spread. Um, but then there is also a very important adaptive immune system in plants that was only discovered about um, 15 or 20 years ago, and that's the siRNA system. So plants that are infected, especially this is especially effective against viruses. Plants that are infected with a virus will make these small RNAs, small interfering RNAs that are specific to the virus that they're infected with. And um, these destroy the viral genome, so they, they uh, they um, anneal to the virus the RNA or DNA and, and basically trigger it being wiped out. So that's an adaptive immune system in plants. Um, it's different than animal systems, um, not only because the whole system is different, but also because it doesn't have the same kind of memory. Mm -hmm. So if a plant is able to clear an infection, you don't find those specific adaptive uh, molecules there anymore. It might would, and so as far as we know, it doesn't like have an enhanced ability to inter, to um, counteract the, the same virus coming in again. On the other hand, mo there's been almost no studies of of um, plant infections, repeated infections mm -hmm. with the same virus, because all the work we do in crop plants, you know, we just look, they basically the plants die or they're they're called out or something. <clears throat> so we don't really look much at plants actually clearing viruses. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't really know. We know in wild plants that they can be reinfected um, or they can clear viruses, yeah. but there's been very little study on that. And this, is, this actually gets uh, to a, an important distinction in how we study 
uh, infections in animals and plants. Mm -hmm. And because, because of the, the memory that's inherent in the adaptive immune system, the antibodies that are circulating, we can actually test for the presence of prior infection mm -hmm. in animal systems. And we don't have a good analog of that right. in plant systems. So it's hard to go to look at a cross section, you know, a snapshot in time, and look back and see what have those, what have long lived plants experienced in right. the past. Of course, now bacteria have long-lived immunity. Right. I don't know if you brought that up or not, but CRISPRs give you the yes. long, long history right. of, of what they've been exposed to. But much of our understanding of immunity, particularly in animals, comes from studies of laboratory mice. Right. And uh, I think when you start going away from the basic mammalian system, we know very little. We know very little about immunity in reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Mm -hmm. and, and the invertebrates as well. So there's, there's a huge area of research still mm. needed here. Right. But the one thing it always tells me is you know, the, there are these very complex, important responses by the animal, whoever it is. And it shows you that it is such an important selective force that parasites and pathogens have just been very important in the life history yeah. of all living organisms. Mm -hmm. mm.